RDD is this, this notion of a schema RDD. So it's got all of the normal features that RDDs have, but we also know the column names and the types of the data stored in there. And what this allows us to do is you can now express declarative transformations. So you say what data you want to retrieve, and we decide when we can filter things out, when we don't need to read certain data off disk, what the most efficient algorithm for doing a join is. Kind of all of that is taken care of you, for you. And it's because of this extra information that we have in, in the form of schema. It allows us to turn these objects instead into tuples. And this isn't an either or proposition. You can actually go back and forth between RDDs and schema RDDs. So the way we're viewing this is kind of as a unified abstraction for working with data. So whether you want to write your data analysis pipeline in Python, Scala, HiveQL, Java, um, you can do it through schema RDDs, and you can access a wide variety of data sources using this unified API. So we have support for Parquet, JSON, Hive, and Cassandra. And you know we're also working on oh, oh yeah, and we're also working on. Um, other integrations, Cassandra and SQL 92, are, are kind of future work, things that we would like to integrate into the stack as well. So how do you actually do this? I've got some data in an RDD. I want to turn it into a table. Uh, so one of the nice things is it's actually relatively concise to do that. So this is an example in Python. And I've got you know, my standard RDD operations. I load in uh, a text file. I split it by, uh, by commas. I break it into parts. And all I need to do is create a Python dictionary where the keys of that dictionary are going to be the names of the columns. And once I've created a new RDD that contains these dictionary objects, I can just pass it to a SQL context. And so I tell the SQL context to infer the schema. It looks at all of the columns that exist, and then creates a table. And once you've got this, this schema RDD or this table out, now you can all, all you have to do is say register as table, and it immediately becomes accessible to SQL functions. Just like everything else in Spark, all of this is lazy. I'm just providing the lineage or the transformation that allows this data to be viewed as a SQL table. Um, so of course, we don't, we, uh, Python's not the only answer. You can also do this inside of Scala. So in Scala, instead of creating a dictionary, you create a case class. So now you've actually got a type safe way to, uh, to define the, the schema of, of your table. And we basically use uh, compile time Scala reflection to ask the compiler for the schema of that case class. In this case, we even support things like nested case classes. So if you've got kind of more complicated data that doesn't fit into a, into a flat row, uh, you can also put in uh, repeated data types. So if you've got arrays or even arrays of case classes, all of that can be represented using, using the schema and then turned into a table. Um, and finally, we also support Java. Uh, it's a little bit more code than the other two languages. <laughs> Um, but all you have to do is create a Java bean. And so you, you create a Java bean, you travel back to the 90s, and uh, you can then load your, your data into, uh, into Spark SQL that way. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's getting data in, but now I kind of want to mix processing. So I, I want to kind of easily be able to move back and forth between my, my kind of full-featured programming language and SQL. And so this is one of the things that Ali really highlighted in his demo this morning. Um, one of the features we're adding in, in Spark SQL 1.1 is this notion of, of language integrated UDFs. So in a typical database system, when you want to uh, create a UDF, you have to implement some class. There's a lot of boilerplate. I have to compile it into a jar. I have to upload that to the cluster. I have to hope that it got registered correctly. Debugging it is kind of difficult. Um, in this case, just in your Spark program, all you need to say is register function. Uh, you pass it a Lambda function. This works in both Python and, uh, and Scala. And that immediately becomes accessible. And we're reusing all of Spark's closure shipping magic to make that work. Um, so it's kind of pretty easy to, to define things. And as soon as you do that, you can now use this function inside of your SQL queries. Uh, another really kind of cool, cool part about, about this integration that we're talking about is, is the ability to use some of the other higher level primitives uh, that, that Spark provides. Uh, so take, for example, you know, I've got a whole bunch of data. I've got a bunch of users and some demographic data about those users. Uh, but I also have an events table of actions that have occurred. Using these past actions and this demographic data, I want to predict which users are going to be likely to take some action in the future. So I can you know, maybe target them for a campaign or something. Uh, so the first part of this sounds like something that SQL would be perfect at. It's going to be basically taking two data sources, joining it, pulling out the parts that I'm interested in. Maybe you'll even do some aggregations. Uh, so, so in this case, I basically just take the users table, uh, join it with the events table uh, on, on where the, the users' IDs are equal, and I pull out all of the features that I want. 
but the, the result of this SQL query is a schema RDD. So you know, no computation has been done. I haven't sucked all of the data back through JDBC back to my single machine or something. It remains distributed out in the, in the cluster, and I can continue to do transformations on it using a higher level programming language. So in this case, I'm going to write a function called featureize, and featureize is going to take these rows and turn them into feature vectors. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is we're just going to pull out the action as the label of the point, and then we're going to create an array of the actual uh, the, the features for each user. And once we've done this, it's now in the form to dump into MLlib. So I can take an off-the-shelf, parallelized machine learning algorithm provided by uh, MLlib. In this case, we're using uh, lo logistic regression. And I can just dump that training data in and get a model out. So you've seen we've kind of mixed an off-the-shelf library, some custom processing, and you know, extraction of data from an existing data source into a, a complete analytics pipeline. Um, so one of the big parts of this is actually getting that data from these existing systems and, and pulling it in into the Spark SQL e ecosystem. So an incredibly important part of that is Hive compatibility. So I, I hinted at this a little bit. Um, but basically what we have is we have interfaces to access data and code that exists in, in the Hive ecosystem already. Uh, so simply uh, by creating a Hive context, you can now write your queries in HQL. Um, we even support things like the, the transform uh, clause where you can uh, have scripts executed as the result of your, your SQL commands. Um, we get catalog info from the Hive Meta Store, so you don't need all you need to do is just drop your Hive site XML file into the configuration directory, and we'll automatically find all of your tables. Um, we support reading uh, data f using all of the different Hive CERDES, even if you have you have custom CERDES. And then finally, if you've got existing investment in UDFs or UDAFs or UDTFs. We have wrappers that allow you to convert those into Spark SQL UDFs. You can kind of use them right out of the box. And this means that you can actually use all of the existing Hive UDFs as well. So even though this is a relatively young project, uh, it's got kind of a, a fairly full-featured uh, ecosystem of, of tools around it already. Um, so working with Hive is pretty simple. Uh, basically, instead of creating a SQL context, I create this thing called a Hive context. This is just a subclass of a SQL context that adds all of the, the extra Hive functionality. And once you've, once you've created a SQL context, um, all you need to do is use the HQL commands. You can actually run both SQL and HQL uh, against, against your Hive data. Um, if you use the HQL parsing interface, you can do DDL and stuff as well. So you can see in this case I'm saying uh, create a table or load data into that table. All of this is just passed directly back to Hive. So you should have kind of the, the, the full feature to, uh, to, to create tables in exactly the same way as if you were sitting in front of a Hive console. And then finally, you, know, you, can, you can actually express the queries using HiveQL and, and get the answers back as a, as a schema RDD. Um, so Hive, Hive is only one of the, the data sources that, that we're interested in, uh, in allowing people to access. And actually another, another kind of, I think, very important one is, is Parquet. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Parquet is an open source project. Uh, it's what Impala uses to store data. It's uh, heavily used outside, outside of Twitter. And uh, Dave Patterson actually talked about it today. They're using it inside of the AMP Lab as well. Do you have a question? Uh, are those Spark SQL formats? Yes, all, anything that you can read with a Hive Serdy, you can read with Spark SQL. Because we, ha we wrote our own importer for Parquet that is much faster than the Hive Serdy for Parquet. Um, and the other nice thing about Parquet is it's, it's a self-describing storage format, so you don't need a meta store. So you can actually just point at Parquet files and get all of the column names out of it automatically. And we, that integrates nicely with Spark SQL. So that, I, I would say that's why I call this out specially. But you, you certainly can read ORC files as well. Um, and so like I, like I said, basically RDDs can be written to Parquet files and you preserve all of the schema information. So uh, Brian was talking about in, in the video this morning about TSV files from one system to another, not being sure if you were getting the columns right. This is, this is kind of one of the things that we're trying to solve here. Um, so I'm going to try to do a demo. Uh, not as ambitious as uh, Ali's demo, but, but something. Um, So uh, this is, this is a, a kind of an extension of the data set that Ali used this morning in his demo. 
Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and I'm going to kick off this SQL query. And let's walk through the pipeline that we actually use to process this. So this was a data set from, from a security research group at Berkeley. And basically what it was is it's 5.2 terabytes of JSON data stored in S3. So it's about you know, over, over 5,000 files, each which has a, a gigabyte of JSON inside of it. And we're able to load it in using Spark. So we kind of use the, the standard Spark way uh, uh, of loading it in. We create a text file. Um, we filter out blank lines because you know, big data is almost always dirty, and so there, there's some corrupted stuff in there. Um, and then what you can see is, uh, is actually reading this data off of S3 takes a pretty long time. It's, a, it's actually a fairly large data set. So even just doing the work of, of downloading it from S3 and decompressing it, it took uh, over, over 10 minutes in this example. Uh, and that, that's not parsing the JSON. That's not doing any interesting analysis on top of it. it it's just decompressing it. So one of the things that, that Spark SQL allows you to do is use schema RDDs as this kind of unified interface to move in between data formats. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an analyst. I want to run a bunch of different queries o over this data set. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to convert it into Parquet. Uh, so what you can do is a uh, new feature in uh, Spark SQL 1.1 is going to be the ability to seamlessly load in JSON data uh, fr from a text file. So you point this, this command JSON RDD at, at an existing uh, chunk of JSON data. We scan over it, we infer the schema, and we then convert that into a table. And so uh, at that point, you can now take that table, and you could do queries on it directly. So let's say I, this is a one-time one -time analysis. I don't want to pay the price of converting it to Parquet, so I'm only going to read it once. You could use that as a table, and you could run queries over it right away. But if I know that I'm going to be doing quite a few operations on it, I want something a little bit more efficient, uh, I can actually then convert it to Parquet just by saving save as Parquet file. And what that does is it actually uh, you know, kind of writes it all out in this efficient columnar format. Um, once I've got a Parquet file, I can actually register it now as a table. So you can load in Parquet files, just like I said very easily, just point at the directory that holds all of them. We automatically infer all of the column names and data types. And then anything that you, you load in as a table, can be registered, or anything you load in as a scheme RDD can be registered as a table. So now that I've got that, I can actually kind of access it. So we'll do table last week. And this is going to give me a schema RDD. And if I want to actually see the whole schema of it, I can do print schema. I should give a, a quick plug. Um, Yin, the guy who did the JSON support, is giving another talk in the third session today. So if you're interested in learning kind of more of the nitty gritty details about our JSON support, you should go to his talk. Um, but you can see it actually fully inferred the relatively complex schema of, uh, of this, this JSON data set. So Twitter actually puts all sorts of information in there. Um, we, uh, we maintain any nesting that occurs. We support arrays that exist inside of the JSON. Uh, all of that can be represented. And the really cool thing here is even though this data is still stored in S3, even though it's, it's, not something, it's something that you know, I couldn't fit in the memory of this cluster, we're now able to do operations over it significantly faster. Uh, so in this case, I did a count star, and it finished in 30 seconds. So that's 10 minutes to just decompress the JSON data down to 30 seconds for running a trivial query. Um, but you know, trivial queries aren't particularly fun, so let's try to do something a little bit more complicated. Um, and so what I can do here is I'm, this is the UDF that Ali used this morning. I'm going to register this function hour of day, which uses uh, everyone's favorite uh, time parsing library, Joda time. And now I'm able to run this query, and you can see this aggregation query, reading 5,000 files off of S3, this is not cached in memory, took just slightly over a minute to execute. Yes? Oh, this is the Databricks Cloud platform that I'm showing here. So uh, limited beta coming soon. Sign up on our website. <laughs> so, yes? OK, come and talk to me afterwards. Because they're, they're working in some cases, though that query would have taken very long. But I, I'd love to, to, to fix any issues you're having. So in this demo, I kind of showed how you can take JSON and turn it into a schema RDD, turn schema RDDs into Parquet, and turn those back into schema RDDs. And then you can execute SQL queries, Spark jobs, UDFs against any of those. Uh, so I'm running out of time, but I really quickly want to talk about performance. Uh, so it's not just about converting data into more efficient formats. 
Um, we've actually been doing a whole bunch of cool things uh, with expression evaluation. So this is a preview of what's to come in 1.1. Uh, those of you who have tried to write a database before, expression evaluation can be incredibly expensive. You have virtual function calls, you're branching based on expression type, you're creating a lot of objects on the JVM. Um, so as a quick example of why, why this is so expensive, let's look at just evaluating A plus B. So I've got a query, I say select A plus B, what's actually going to happen on the JVM when you interpret this? Well, you're gonna start off by calling the eval function on the top node in this tree. So we've created this expression tree to represent it. We call eval on add. It's going to then make another virtual function call to its child, say, okay, now you give me your value. Um, that's going to return a boxed integer, so we're actually allocating an object there in order to hold that value. Um, we're gonna make another virtual function call to b to get its value. That's gonna return another box value. Uh, and then we're actually gonna do the work. We're gonna do a single integer addition operation. That was, that was what we actually wanted to accomplish. And then we're going to box again. So that was pretty expensive. I think we can probably do better. Uh, and we're doing that with this really cool feature that they just added in Scala 2.10 called runtime reflection. So instead of interpreting this code, what Spark SQL is going to do is actually going to generate bytecode at runtime for the specific expressions that exist in your queries. Um, so this is kind of just a really simple example of how we're doing it, but you can see we're doing pattern matching here on attribute. So when we see an attribute, the, we're going to generate the code for actually retrieving that attribute. And then you see these things that look like strings, but they start with the letter Q. That's called a quasi quote. And so what a quasi quote is, is it's not a string, it's actually a piece of Scala code, and the result of that, that block of code is actually a Scala AST. So I'm actually getting back the, the abstract syntax tree for this program, and the really cool thing about the way quasi quotes and reflection work is Scala makes it very easy to splice these together to create the entire evaluation operation. So, you know, we've got add here. It just recurses on its child to get the left value and the right value, splices those trees in, and adds up the result. And so what you end up with is code that looks significantly more like this. We have two operations to get the, the data out of the rows. We store those into primitive values. Uh, we store the result in, uh, also as a primitive value, and then we, we write it back into the row. And the, the, the key here is there's fewer function calls, and there's no boxing of primitives. So it's actually quite a bit faster. And you know, this is actually a well-known trick. Database people have known for years that code generation makes your queries run faster, so we're not, we're not novel in that regard. What's really cool here is that Scala reflection and quasi quotes made this a very easy thing to add to our system. So a combination of the Catalyst optimizer, some of these cool language features that we're using, mean that this was kind of an experiment that we started over a weekend and had amazing performance results instead of a major overhaul of the system. In fact, the initial version was only a thousand lines of code. So that means that our code generation is actually quite extensible. So we plan to kind of hard code in as many of the different types of expressions that you, you evaluate commonly in SQL, and it's very easy for kind of you as developers to contribute back to this system as well. So we gotta have a performance micro benchmark to see if this works. Uh, so I'm gonna try to evaluate A plus A plus A a billion times. And so if I do this the naive way using the interpreted evaluation, it takes quite a while. If I sit down as a you know, pretty good Scala programmer and I write down custom Spark code to do this as efficiently as possible, I can get it to be this fast. So you know, now it's, uh, it's down to under 10 seconds. Using Scala reflection is almost exactly the same. So you can get hand-coded performance just by writing SQL queries. So I'm, almo I'm almost done, but I wanna talk just kind of a, a brief overview of the features that are slated for the 1.1 release. Uh, so we're hoping to include this code generation patch that I'm talking about now. Um, we're definitely going to have these language integrated UDFs, which I showed off and Ali showed off during his talk this morning. Um, we're working on adding, we've added broadcast join and we're working on uh, kind of automatically selecting when that's the, that's the right thing to do using cost estimation. Um, we're gonna have support for JSON and nested parquet. And finally, there's been a whole slew of performance and stability improvements. So you know, if you're, if you're still running 1.1, you should uh, definitely check out, or 1.0, you should definitely check out 1.01 because uh, we, we've been hard at work. And here's just a real quick preview of the performance. Uh, this is a comparison of Spark SQL with the code gen patch in a development branch compared to the most recent release of Shark. And so you can see in all cases, it's a little bit faster. And for some of the more complicated queries where there's a lot of expression evaluation, we're actually seeing an 8x speed up over Shark. So we're, we're pretty excited about, about the, the possibilities for Spark SQL. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, if I have time for questions, I'll take a couple. One, one question. <laughs> Yes.
So, so uh, all, all of the, yeah, yeah. Can the guys from DataStax um, come up to the stage? Oh, here. Yeah, so Spark and all of its components are released in lockstep. So Spark SQL 1.1 will be released with Spark 1.1. The current target for that is August. Um, and all of the details about the timeline and code freeze and all of that are on the Spark website. So yeah, ch check that out. And you know, we'll, we'll be posting to the dev list kind of as, as the development schedule progresses. So It will be in 1.1, but it'll also be in this preview release, which I, I put the URL up for. So you. Yes, that's a good question. So it's definitely not going to be in 1.0.1 because we've already cut that release candidate. We don't want to cram any more features in. Um, in terms of 1.02, there's a question of whether or not it's okay to cram a giant feature into a maintenance release. Um, we really want yeah. people to be able to upgrade without being afraid that we're going to break things. And so we're pretty hesitant to put that in there. But the, the, the branch that I put up there is compatible with 1.0. You can use it on 1.0 clusters. Um, yeah, so I, I would definitely check out that, that branch. Thanks.